Good morning. I'm Ann Maxwell, the Dean at St. Andrew's Episcopal Cathedral here in Jackson, Mississippi, and I'm delighted you have decided to worship with us today. Please note if you are, have made a reservation and you are coming here to the cathedral for the second part of the service, remember to bring your mask, to park on the street unless you need the handicap entrance in the garage. If you're going to sit on the pulpit side of the church, please enter through the back door and down that side aisle. If you're going to uh, sit on the lectern side of the church, please enter through the courtyard door down the center aisle. Thank you. I hope you've had a wonderful 4th of July weekend as well, and I offer this prayer for our country. Let us pray. Almighty God, who has given us thy, this good land for our heritage, we humbly beseech thee that we may always prove ourselves a people mindful of thy favor and glad to do thy will. Bless our land with honorable industry, sound learning, and pure manners. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from pride and arrogance, and from every evil way. Defend our liberties and fashion into one united people the multitudes brought hither out of many kindreds and tongues. And do with the spirit of wisdom those to whom in thy name we entrust the authority of government, that there may be justice and peace at home, and that through obedience to thy law we may show forth thy praise among the nations of the world. In this time of prosperity, fill us with our hearts with thankfulness, and in the day of trouble, suffer not our trust in thee to fail. All which we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Blessed be the one holy and living God. Glory to God forever and ever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. taught us to keep all your commandments by loving you and our neighbor. Grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit, that we may be devoted to you with our whole heart and united to one another with pure affection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Genesis. The servant said to Laban, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master, and he has become wealthy. He has been given flocks and herds, silver and gold, male and female slaves, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old and he has given him all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, Ye shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I live, but you shall go to my father's house, to my kindred, and get a wife for my son. I came today to the spring and said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if you will now only make successful the way I am going. I am standing here by the spring of water. Let the young woman who comes to out to draw, to whom I shall say, Please give me a little water from your jar to drink, and who will say to me, Drink, and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Before I had finished speaking in my heart, there was Rebecca coming out with a water jar on her shoulder, and she went down to the spring and drew. I said to her, Please let me drink. She quickly let down her jar from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will also draw water for your camels. Then I asked her, Whose daughter are you? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Malachi bore to him. So I put the ring on her nose and bracelets on her arms. Then I bowed my head, and I worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me the right way to obtain the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. 
Now then, if you will deal loyally and truly with my master, tell me, and if not, tell me, so that I may either turn to the right hand or to the left. And they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will. So they sent away their sister Rebekah and her nurse along with Abram's sister and his men, and they blessed Rebekah and said to her, May you, our sister, become thousands of myriads. May your offspring gain possessions of the gates of their foes. Then Rebekah and her maids rose up, mounted the camels, and allowed the man, and followed him. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Now Isaac had come from Beer Lahori and was settled in the Negeb. Isaac went out in the evening to walk in the fields, and looking up, he saw camels coming. And Rebekah looked up, and when she saw Isaac, she slipped quickly from the camel and said to the servant, Who is the man over there walking in the fields to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. He took Rebekah and she became his wife and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. The Word of the Lord. Please join me in reading from Psalm 45. Hear, O daughter, consider and listen closely. Forget your people and your father's house. The king will have pleasure in your beauty. He is your master, therefore do him honor. The people of Tyre are here with a gift. The rich among the people seek your favor. All glorious is the princess as she enters. Her gown is cloth of gold. In embroidered apparel, she is brought to the king. After her, the bridesmaids follow in procession. With joy and gladness, they are brought and enter into the palace of the king. In place of fathers, O king, you shall have sons. You shall make them princes over all the earth. I will make your name to be remembered from one generation to another. Therefore, nations will praise you forever and ever. A reading from Romans. Do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you are entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of the natural limitations. Just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater inequity, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for sanctifications. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from the sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
the word of the Lord. According to Matthew. Glory to you, O Christ. Jesus said to the crowd, but, but to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, O Christ. Come and rest. Be relieved of your burdens, says Jesus. And what a lovely invitation this seems to be, especially now. Because if you are anything like me, you are tired. Tired of a pandemic and injustice and all the restrictions that we currently find ourselves facing. So it seems nice to have these familiar words come at the end of a somewhat confusing gospel reading. It's the kind of verse that we would perhaps paint on a picture or embroider into a pillow, a seeming little reminder that we can just let it all go and take a nap. But. I don't think that a nap is really what Jesus is talking about, given the rest of today's gospel reading. In fact, in the beginning of the passage, Jesus seems pretty angry and maybe even tired himself. He is decrying the faithless generation, their inability to recognize himself or John as prophets, the failures of the wise to see beyond their own limited perspective to something bigger. In the few verses that the lectionary reading skips, Jesus is issuing woes to unrepentant cities. 
Frankly, it seems like a lot of warnings and admonitions that should make us all very uncomfortable rather than put us at ease. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn, he says. We have been here telling you the good news of the kingdom of God, and yet you are not seeing it and rejoicing. We have warned you of the things that you need to repent of, and yet you have turned away. When John came, you said that he was too strange, too self-denying to be sent by God. And when Jesus came, he was too indulgent and too much a part of the world to be the Messiah. In the verses preceding this passage, John's disciples had come to Jesus asking if he was the one to come or if they should be expecting another. The blind see, the deaf hear, the dead are made alive, he tells them. What more evidence do you need? Jesus seems to be asking this not just to the disciples, but to the whole crowd around him. Both Jesus and John were defying expectations and upending the normal social order, and there was no way in the minds of the people that someone like that could be from God. Surely the crowds thought they knew exactly who God was. After all, they had grown up as a part of God's chosen people, so how could they not? They knew the law, they knew the prophets, and they had established an entire way of life around those teachings. When God showed up, they were going to be prepared, and they were going to know exactly what God would look like. And a man who came to hang out with prostitutes and tax collectors, who questioned and challenged the established experts, and who seemed more interested in healing and empowering those who they had firmly placed at the bottom of the social hierarchy, certainly was not it. It's easy to look back on those crowds now with criticism and judgment. For how could they not know? How could they not see healing and life springing up all around them and not believe that it was from God? But honestly, I don't think it's really all that surprising that the crowds were resistant when a couple of essentially nobodies who came from unknown and low-class families came around telling them that they were doing it all wrong. Jesus did not fit into their picture of who they believed God was, and aren't we all prone to reject something or someone who doesn't fit our expectation or brings a message that doesn't make sense in our perceived understanding of the world? In fact, I think we often, as modern-day Christians, do the exact same thing. We have created our own expectations and norms and boxes of what constitutes good religion. And when something is too loud or too uncomfortable or too far outside of that box that we have built to contain God, we also turn away. I wonder if we too are refusing to dance to the flute or mourn when we hear wailing, to miss the new life that is springing up all around us because it doesn't quite line up with our expectation of who God is. Now Jesus follows all of this up by giving us that famous line that we have all heard quoted again and again. Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. When we hear these words about laying down our burdens, I think our first inclination is to think about the things that we want to escape from. What are the immediate unpleasant things that I don't want to have to do that I can let go of? the uncomfortable conversation about racism with our family, or the extra time that it takes to go check on a friend who is hurting, or wearing our masks to protect ourselves and our neighbors in the middle of a global pandemic. These things are not fun, and these things are not easy. Sometimes they feel like burdens, and it's really tempting to believe that Jesus is giving us permission to just let them all go and take a nap. But, as we've been reminded in sermons and readings over these past few weeks, the road to discipleship is not easy. And I don't think Jesus is just giving us a free pass to get out of uncomfortable things. Rather, I think Jesus is calling us to redefine what we recognize as our burdens. 
Maybe the burdens that we are being invited to let go of are not everyday actions that make us uncomfortable, but the boxes and the limits that we have surrounded ourselves with that prevent us from being able to see the new light springing up all around. As people, and I think particularly as Americans, who tend to prize individualism and autonomy above all else, we spend a lot of our energy on ensuring that we can be self-reliant. We want enough money to prove that we are not dependent on anyone else. We want another degree or seek to prove ourselves in arguments to make sure that everyone knows that we're intelligent enough to solve our own problems. We collect titles and prizes to prove our worth, or at least to prove our own authority. And oftentimes we think that these are the things that will relieve us of our burdens. After all, isn't this the American dream? Have enough of everything to be independent, self-sufficient, and self-reliant. We have come to believe that this is the ultimate form of freedom because who needs to be worried or encumbered by burdens when one already has everything that they need? But it is often in our quest to become independent and self-reliant that we start to build up our walls and our boxes that make our world so much smaller. We become so hyper-focused on building our own little private shelter that we fail to notice anyone or anything outside of those walls we've built. And as we close off our world and our community around us, I think we create those expectations just like the crowds did around Jesus. We expect that God is contained within these boundaries that we've drawn because we cannot see outside of them. We might think that we have found freedom and security in our own private little bunker, but I dare say that it comes at a high cost because we, like the crowds, also do not recognize where God is showing up. We are also failing to dance with the flute and to mourn with the wailers because we do not even realize that they exist. And when we are trapped behind these tight walls of protection, is that even really freedom? But perhaps Jesus is inviting us to a new and different kind of freedom. What if Jesus is telling us that our intellect, our privilege, our riches are the very burdens hindering us the most? What if when Jesus asks the crowds to lay down their burdens, he's not just talking about the difficult things that we already want to avoid, but the very things that we have thought were protecting us? Because it is not, according to Jesus, the wise and the most gifted who know God. It is the weak, the small, the unintelligent who understand God. It is those who we despise and look down upon, who we often assume are lacking or deficient, who know God best. The basic fact, says pastor and theologian Howard Thurman, is that Christianity, as it was born in the mind of this Jewish teacher and thinker, Jesus, appears as a technique of survival for the oppressed. That it became, through the intervening years, a religion of the powerful and dominant, used sometimes as an instrument of oppression, must not tempt us into believing that it was thus in the mind and life of Jesus. When Jesus, when Jesus' spirit appears, Thurman continues, the oppressed gather fresh courage, for he announced the good news that fear, hypocrisy, and hatred, the three hounds of hell that track and trail the disinherited, need have no dominion over them. This, uncomfortably, is the opposite of the American dream. We have been sold the promise that if we get all of these things, money and accolades and privilege, we'll be happy and we'll be free. But in the kingdom of God, we are told it is just the opposite. God does not come to make the rich richer or affirm our social hierarchies. God comes to say blessed are the poor and those who are hungry and those who mourn. Those are the people who Jesus surrounded himself with, and it was in those communities that God's love and power and incarnation was made known. 
And if we have done everything that we can to separate ourselves from those communities, then I don't know where we expect to see God. We are not being asked to lay down our burdens so that we can be a little bit more comfortable. We are being asked to lay down our burdens so that we are uninhibited from seeing God and the life that God is bringing all around us. Because when we let down our walls and pretenses and the things that we believe were protecting us, we start to see the world around us. Instead of being hyper-focused on ourselves and our own stories, we notice that our elderly neighbor hasn't left the house in two weeks and we offer to pick up our groceries for them. We see our community members who are disproportionately hurt by the COVID-19 pandemic and we find ways to provide food and support as they work to meet the needs of their families. We willingly wear our masks to the grocery store because it's no longer about what makes me comfortable, but it's a way to love my neighbor and care for the health and their health and safety too. And in all of those things, we are a part of bringing that life around us. I think of the words of our Eucharistic prayer, that ask God to deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. We are not invited to lay down our burdens so that our lives are a little easier. In fact, after we lay our burdens down, we are still asked to take the yoke of Christ upon us. But the yoke is not heavy with fear, hypocrisy, and hatred as our burdens were. It is easy and light, bringing strength and renewal. Amen. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. 
He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for people everywhere according to their need. Gracious God, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the United Church of Pakistan. In the Diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for the Standing Committee and Trustees and San Cristobal Church, Panama City, Panama. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for Jenny and Sarah, our seminarian and deacon in training. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. O oh God Almighty, in whose name the founders of this country won liberty for themselves and for us, and lit the torch of freedom for people and nations then unborn. Grant that we and all who share this land may have grace to maintain our liberties in righteousness and peace through Jesus Christ, our Savior, in whom all are free. In our community cycle of prayer, we pray for the McLean Fletcher Center. We give thanks for all who celebrate a birthday today, especially Isabella and Jeffrey. We give thanks for the marriage of Ashley and Ellen. Are there other thanksgivings? Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. We pray for those whose lives and livelihoods are disrupted or endangered by COVID-19. We pray for help in the hard work of dismantling pervasive and systemic racism that we might at last do your justice, love your mercy, and walk humbly together with you in our midst, leading us into beloved community. We pray for all who suffer in mind, body, or spirit, especially Ray, Eric, Jerry, Kitty, Doris, Jeff, Carol, Jeff, Richard, Joe, Robin, JR, Jean, Stephen, Mike, Tom, Boyce, Jeff, Kay, Barbara, Sally, Jane, Daniel, Leela, Armistead, Kathy, Carrie, Mary, Lacey, Bill, Kelis, Mary, Jane, Bill, and others whom we name in our hearts or aloud. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. We remember those who have died, especially Anil, Mike, Jimmy, Jim, Jane, Carl, and others whom we name in our hearts or aloud. Give to the departed eternal rest. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. O oh God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus, your son. Look with compassion upon the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love and work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth that in your good time, all people may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbors. 
God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. May the peace of Christ be always with you. And also with you. Let us with gladness present the offerings and oblations of our hearts to God. Come Holy Spirit, come with energy divine and With beams of mercy shine Melt, melt this frozen heart This stubborn will subdue And for me all anew. Mine will the prophet be, but thine shall be the praise. And Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God our thanks and praise. We praise you and we bless you, holy and gracious God, source of life abundant. From before time you made ready the creation. Your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being, sun, moon, and stars, earth, winds, and waters, and every living thing. You made us in your image and taught us to walk in your ways. But we rebelled against you and wandered far away. And yet, as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again, you called us to live in the fullness of your love. And so this day, we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity lifting our voices to magnify you as we say, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Glory and honor and praise to you, holy and living God, to deliver us from the power of sin and death, and to reveal the riches of your grace. You looked with favor upon Mary, your willing servant, that she might conceive and bear a son, Jesus, your holy child. Living among us, Jesus loved us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners, healed the sick, and proclaimed good news to the poor. He yearned to draw all the world to himself, 
yet we were heedless of his call to walk in love. Then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again he gave thanks to you, gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Now gathered at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer to you our gifts of bread and wine and ourselves, a living sacrifice. Pour out your Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the body and blood of Christ. Breathe your spirit over the whole earth and make us your new creation, the body of Christ given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, bring us with Andrew and all your saints from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world through Christ, and with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah! In these next moments of meditation, you are invited to receive whatever gifts God provides for you in whatever way God provides them. We are one body in Christ when we share our prayers and presence. <laughs>
Let us pray together. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your Spirit, that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. Now live without fear. Your Creator has made you holy, has always protected you and loves you as a mother. Go in peace to follow the good road and the blessing of God who made you and loves you and keeps you be with you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God.